what you know or imagine about space and space exploration is likely inspired by what you've seen on the TV or in movies. Because images of space are everywhere. Personally, I love the Marvel franchise. It's a little unrealistic, but it's great entertainment. Now, movies and TV shows and any form of science media that feature space in any capacity are actually quite important because they help you to be inspired and excited by space and also the sheer possibilities that could exist in the future. Without public interest in space, space programs wouldn't happen at all in the first place. My role in the space industry is a public communicator. My passion is for making rocket science accessible and understood by the general public. I'm also hoping to partake in a private space flight in the coming years. And today I want to talk to you about our future as a human species in space. And as we're discussing the role of human, human habitation in space and on other bodies in space, like planets and moons, I want you to ask yourself, if you think space belongs to no one, or to everyone, so let's start out by making sure we're all on the same page when it comes to appreciating where we are and where we're going when it comes to space exploration. For a little more than two decades now, humans have been permanently living in space by means of the International Space Station. But we're about to take this much further because there are already plans in development for a permanent human presence on the moon and not long thereafter on Mars as well. This will make humans an off-world species. We will no longer just be living on the Earth and in orbit around the Earth, but on other bodies in space, too. I can confidently assure you that within our lifetimes, we will watch the first humans make their prints on the surface of Mars. Space is also all around us and likely more ingrained in your daily life than you might think. Space technologies and space science research have been applied to things like advancements in technology inside cochlear implants, MRI machines, advancing protocols for food safety, food storage. Most notably, the satellite technology that you and I rely on 24-7 for location and internet services. Space also encourages us to think big. It allows us to ask big questions like, where did we come from? Are we alone? In this way, space allows us to draw on a human trait that we all have in common, which is curiosity and our desire to explore what we don't know. Some of the most innovative engineering feats, the most profound and impactful scientific discoveries, and the biggest achievements in international cooperation have come from our desire to explore space. In this way, space allows us to do things that have never been done before, but also allows us to ask questions that have never before been asked. How will we sell real estate on the moon? How will we govern a society on Mars? How are we going to establish borders in space? Sure, there are, these are some pretty big questions, but the search to answering them is already well underway. The next humans will make their mark on the moon in the coming years. And most importantly, this will include the first woman and the first person of color to do so. By looking back at significant milestones in space exploration, like the 1969 moon landing, we can still be inspired and excited today. Even looking back in aviation history, we are reminded of just how far we've come in impressively little time. In 1967, the Outer Space Treaty was signed, which established the first guidelines that outlaid what we can and cannot do in space. This treaty even detailed banning the stationing of weapons of mass destruction in space. Now, this treaty has been signed by 111 countries so far, but as you can imagine, since 1967, we've come a pretty long way in space exploration. So soon it will be time to draft some amendments and new treaties all together that will dictate how we behave and govern ourselves in space. Asking these new questions comes from examining what's already been done on Earth. In fact, much of the language in the Outer Space Treaty was based on the conventions and laws that govern our seas and oceans. Consider the possibility of creating new regulatory and governing systems from scratch for those who will be living in space. 
We're at the precipice of something really exciting, but as you can understand, it's also quite important. We are breaking new ground on quite a monumental scale. We are doing this to explore and to push ourselves. We're not setting up bases on the moon and Mars because we want to abandon the lives that we have here on Earth already. So let me be very clear. There is no planet B. We are doing this because it excites and inspires us and because space is out there. So let's take the best of our collective knowledge and experience and skills when we go and push ourselves further into space. Let's look no further than waste disposal to see how humans have already adapted some of their habits and practices from Earth into space. Space junk can be any human-made object that is in Earth's orbit but is no longer being used. So this can include old satellites that are no longer in operation, old rocket parts, some pieces that were created from space junk collisions. There's even lost astronaut tools in orbit around the Earth like spatulas and astronaut gloves. It's estimated today there's roughly 35,000 pieces of space junk that are at least the size of a Rubik's Cube that are in orbit around our planet. But they're each traveling at 10 times the speed of a bullet. And at that rate, even the smallest pieces of space junk can cause big damage. In fact, just yesterday, it was announced that the robotic Canada arm, which is on our International Space Station and is featured on the Canadian $5 bill, was hit with a piece of space junk. And by examining things like how we apply our waste disposal habits from Earth in space, we're reminded of just how important it is that we put our best efforts forward into space. Today, people want change. And we need to evaluate what change we want to take with us into space and how to implement this change in a place that's completely foreign and new to us. If we fail to listen from the root of today's causes for social unrest and discontent around the world, we can only expect that the same will happen for societies that are living in space as well. We can work on our future on Earth and in space in tandem and adopting new lessons and considerations along the way. Now, part of putting our best efforts forward into space is by examining some assumptions that we might be making. Take aliens, for example. When astronomers are looking for life elsewhere in the solar system or beyond, they're looking for life as you and I know it to be. They're looking for signs of extraterrestrials that also need water, oxygen, sunlight, in order to survive. We often imagine our extraterrestrial encounters will be with human-like creatures, that could threaten our existence here on Earth. But in fact, most scientists expect that our first extraterrestrial encounters will be with microscopic bug-like creatures. So if we abandon some of these expectations, it's a bit fun to let our imagination run wild and to consider life as we don't know it to be. Now, of course, assumptions are our way of making sense of things. So it's expected that we're going to make some along the way. However, holding on to set expectations could prevent us from opening our mind to new ideas. Perhaps you think the future civilizations on the moon and Mars has nothing to do with you. Like it or not, you're part of it because this is our future, but you could also be an agent of change for this future. Most simply, you could try to improve life in any of its aspects here on Earth. We take our ideas, our lessons, our experiences with us from Earth into space. So by improving our future in space, we can also improve our future on Earth. There's also something kind of thrilling about tackling this idea of questions that have never been asked. What unequitable or unjust systems, governing systems that exist today would you adapt? How would you rewrite them all together for those that are living in space? And what could the outer space treaties of the future look like? Part of what I love about my job is keeping those around me up to date on new developments and achievements in space technology, space sciences, because we're truly experiencing quite an exciting time. In the past year alone, we've landed two rovers on Mars. We've also flown a helicopter there. We've announced plans for new space stations, and we brought back samples from an asteroid. This is quite an exciting time. Now, if these developments and these achievements ignite your rocket engines, Perhaps you'll be excited to take a more direct role in our future in space. Much like how we take our practices and ideas from Earth into space, I tell people the same is true if you want to pursue a career in the space industry. So if you want to learn to fly a rocket, 
I encourage you first to learn how to fly an earth-based plane that we all know. We're also going to need skilled welders, plumbers, architects, city planners, to help us build out the first base for humans on the moon in the coming years. If you're a lawyer, or you become one, perhaps you'll be drafting the next Outer Space Treaty. We take our earthly values with us into space. As long as we're challenging existing assumptions, asking questions that have never been asked before, adopting lessons along the way, we will be improving our future on Earth and in space together. Us space folk like to say that we all live in something called Spaceship Earth. If you look around you, these are all your crew members. Because after all, we are all in this together. Look at the spaces around you. Who owns them? What collective responsibility do we have with these shared spaces and how they're regulated, how they're governed? For those on Earth and in the future, those in space as well. I'd now like to ask you again. Do you think space belongs to no one or to everyone?